faithfulness, God. God, it is because of you that we're able to come to church freely and worship you freely, God. And Lord, I thank you for this lesson that you have given us tonight, God, that just teaches your promises and what we need to do to, to be able to stay in your plan, God, just to stay forth with your plan for our life, God. And Lord, and I just pray that you just touch each prayer request that was mentioned, God, the ones that was not even mentioned, Lord. God, you know what needs to be done. You know who it needs to be done to, and you know how it needs to be done. And God, and I just pray all of this in your holy name. Amen. Just to do a quick recap, over the past few weeks, we three weeks ago, we looked at God as our creator. God created the heavens and earth and everything in them. He created mankind with humans being the only creation that he created in his image and likeness, which means we're the only one of God's creations that can have this unique personal relationship with God. And then the next week we looked at Adam and Eve and the fall of man. They started out with a perfect relationship with God, they had everything they needed, and then they disobeyed God by choosing their selfish desires over trusting Him. This choice separated all of humanity from God. And the gap that this disobedience created could only be bridged by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then last week, we looked at God judges sin. God banished Adam and Eve from the garden for their disobedience and humanity has been given in to evil at every turn. Man's weakness had become so great that God grieved at even creating mankind. And he wanted to wipe out every living creature on land and in the air. But there was one man who stood out to God because of his righteousness, and it is through Noah finding favor in the eyes of the Lord that God used him to save humanity and to repopulate the earth. From Adam to Noah, there were ten generations. And then from Noah to Abraham... There was ten generations. After the flood, Noah and his family repopulated the earth. And it is through Noah's descendant, Abraham, well, Abram is where we're going to start out, and then God changes his name to Abraham. God promises that he is going to be the patriarch of many nations. And before we start looking at Abraham and Isaac, I want us to first start out in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 5. Look at the first recorded act of faith and sacrifice of Abraham, which is in Genesis. In verse 1, we see commands from God. The Lord has said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. In verses 2 and 3, we see promises from God. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And then in verses 4 and 5, we see an act of faith and obedience from Abraham. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot with him. Abram was 75 years old when he, had, when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his, lef, his nephew Lot, all of the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Verse 1 Abraham is commanded to leave everything he knows. All of he everything he's comfortable with, his family. And in, in this time, 
each family member relied on their family for protection, for comfort, for support. And God commanded Abraham to leave all of that, leave your father's household, which in turn meant Abraham was going to lose everything that his father was going to give him in inheritance. Verses 2 and 3, God promised Abraham that he would be blessed. And verses 4 and 5, Abraham obeys on faith. Now this passage reveals a lot about why this is a sacrifice and how action of obeying is based on faith. First, Abraham was commanded to leave his home, his family, and his father's household, and everything he knew and everything he was comfortable with, to follow God to a place where he didn't even know he was going to go. When God first commanded Abraham to leave, he didn't tell him where he was going. Just go. Go to a land I will show you. You don't know how long it's going to take to get there. Just pack everything and go. Abraham had more than himself to think about on this journey. He had a wife. He had his nephew. He had the people they had acquired as servants, all of the possessions. So it was more than just him that he had to think about. And then Abraham and Sarah were not young people. When God gave them this command, Abraham was 75 and Sarah was 65. They were not in their 20s full of energy and just ready to go. Abraham had to put all of his faith in God to get to where God wanted him to go. And after calling for Abraham to leave and go to a land that was unknown to him, God promised to make Abraham a great nation and to make his name great. Verse 3 refers to a spiritual blessing that would come through a descendant of Abraham, which is Jesus. God's promise reveals that from the very beginning, the purpose of the gospel was to benefit all people by telling them how they could have a personal relationship with God and discover his plans for them. God continues to accomplish this purpose today through Christ and through his followers who are is taking the word and sending his message to people all over the world. But verse 4 shows that there was no hesitation. I would have been like God. Okay, how much food do I need to take? How much clothes do I need? How long is it going to take to get there? Is there going to be anywhere to stop and, and get food for whenever I run out? There was no questions like that. So Abraham left. They packed everything. They loaded everything. They owned and left to go where God was leading them. From the very start, of the story of Abraham, this emphasizes that obeying God is required in order to have a saving relationship with him. Abraham obeyed God by leaving his home, his family, his country, and by trusting God to guide and care for him. And even today, just as God did with Abraham, God calls us, followers of Christ, to leave our form a way of life in order to follow Jesus. Did anybody enjoy test in school? No. I didn't. I hated school. I didn't like anything about school. But these tests that we had in school was nothing compared to the test that God gave Abraham. Can you play the video? When we're watching this video, I want you to think about this. What is a test you have faced 
that grew your faith in God? I've been out of school for a long time, but every once in a while I have this dream that I showed up to school and had completely forgotten to study for an exam. There's always this ridiculous relief when I wake up and remember that I'm not actually in school anymore. When we think about a test, we naturally think about receiving a grade. A test grades us and responds with a score. A, A minus, B plus. We can even start to identify with these scores. GRE scores, SAT scores, an IQ score, even a performance review at work. You'll sometimes even hear adults still talking about how they were an A or a C student in school. It's easy to carry these ideas about tests and grades with us into our reading of scripture, especially when we come to passages like Genesis chapter 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering one of the mountains, which I will show you. That's startling to read, and it's hard to imagine a more difficult test. Abraham is about to be graded by God, like God is throwing down an exam to see just how much faith Abraham really has. God can seem distant, conniving, judgmental, but that misses something profound about God and about the purpose of these tests, our tests. God is not a professor trying to establish a class curve. He isn't a teacher trying to determine who was and wasn't paying attention during his last lecture. God's tests are not about earning a grade. They are about discovering what is most true about ourselves and about Him. Really, this is what all tests do. They reveal the truth, the truth of who we are and the truth of who God is. Abraham's test is actually the perfect example. Anyone who has followed God for very long knows that faith doesn't guarantee an easy I've been out of school for throwing down an exam to see just how much faith Abraham really has. God can seem distant, conniving, judgmental, but that misses something profound about God and about the purpose of these tests, our tests. God is not a professor trying to establish a class curve. He isn't a teacher trying to determine who was and wasn't paying attention during his last lecture. God's tests are not about earning a grade. They are about discovering what is most true about ourselves and about Him. 
Really, this is what all tests do. They reveal the truth, the truth of who we are and the truth of who God is. Abraham's test is actually the perfect example. Anyone who has followed God for very long knows that faith doesn't guarantee an easier life. If you read the Bible carefully, those who follow God often face significant challenges. Abraham was called to leave everything that he knew and to follow God into a new land. Abraham waited for decades for a child, even into old age, holding on to the promise that God had given him for a son. And now Abraham faced the prospect of sacrificing that very promise. Abraham's faith through these tests was not about earning a grade. These tests reveal that Abraham's faith was genuine and that God was just as faithful in walking with him. It's so easy to convince ourselves that we have our Christian act together. It's easy to imagine that we would do anything for God, go anywhere, sacrifice anything, but when we face a real test, something happens. We're forced to recognize and to take inventory of where we really are, of who we really are. We're forced out of the abstractions and into the reality of God and our true dependence on Him. God's tests create the space for faith and grace and truth. Maybe the thing that is most amazing is not just Abraham's willingness to make that sacrifice, but that ultimately, God would intervene and halt the test. Just as Abraham was about to make the sacrifice, an angel appeared and stopped Abraham's hand. Suddenly, Abraham discovered a ram which would be sacrificed in Isaac's place. Abraham named the place, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. This test, this sacrifice, the one Abraham by faith was willing to make would not ultimately be his test to pass. God would one day make a sacrifice even greater than Abraham's. God would one day sacrifice his own son. God would take up Abraham's test. And so too, every test we face is both ours, but also we discover God's. He is with us. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. What we discover in these tests of life is not just the quality of our own faith. We discover the faithfulness of our God. The author of the New Testament book of Hebrews describes Jesus as the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. These tests are not just about determination or inner strength. Every test is an opportunity to have more of our faith perfected by Jesus Christ. So we listen. When we face challenges, when we face loss, when we face pain, when we struggle to understand, when we're called to things which leave us feeling completely inadequate, we listen, we pray, we humble ourselves, and we turn to his word to discover this great cloud of witnesses, men and women like Abraham, who know what it is to be tested too. And in the midst of these tests, we find something far more valuable than a grade. We find the one who strengthens us and gifts us with the faith we need to make it through. So, we listen. The test that that we have to that we just daily life we find test after test after test. One, whenever I was thinking about this question, what is the test that I faced that grew my faith in God? The main one that I kept going back to it was. Right after I started coming here, I really didn't know much about paying tithes. I was like, oh, I can't. 
I can't pay him like I should because I won't be able to make it the rest of the month. And then through guidance with some amazing leaders that we have here and just step by step just guiding me, they told me, put your faith in God and see what he'll do. And then so I started paying my tithes regularly. And there would be months to where I knew that if I paid them, that on paper, there was no way I could make it that month, much less if anything came up. And sure enough, things would come up. One month, I had just paid my tithes, and then my transmission went out of my car. I was like, man. So, save up, get transmission replaced. Still paying my tithes. But then it just got harder and harder. So, I would back off and just pay what I thought I could pay. And whenever I would do that, things would hit even harder. So, I would go back to paying them like I was supposed to. And then a couple of months later, my radiator went out. So I had to get that replaced. And then a couple of months after that, something else on the car went out. So I had to get that replaced. And now looking back, whenever, whenever I wasn't paying my tithes like I was supposed to and something would go wrong, I ended up having to borrow money from somebody to pay for whatever needed to be done. But whenever... I had started paying them like I was supposed to. It never failed. The transmission that I um, had to get, I ended up getting it like $200 cheaper than I was, or the original price was. The radiator, same thing. I got it $50 cheaper. Each time, God proved himself to me and that grew my faith more and more. Okay, look back. You don't pay. Things happen. You can't pay. You pay your tithes. Things happen. God is going to make a way. And for me, that was, I think that was one of the biggest things that helped grow my faith through test after test after test. This lesson, it has a story in here that I just, I fell in love with the moment that I read it. One day, a chicken and a pig were discussing the difference they were making in the world. The chicken said, for example, look at all the people out there who love having bacon and eggs for breakfast. That's true, replied the pig, but there's just one problem. For you, it's a contribution. For me, it's a sacrifice. And the pig had a point. The chicken wasn't losing anything, and the pig was losing everything. And then you have no risk, no reward, no pain, no gain. And then for those who follow Jesus, Jesus tells us that we need to give up our life, not hang on to it, in order to save it. Matthew 16, 25 says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Sacrifice is at the heart of what Christ did for us on, the, on going to the cross. And it is his sacrificial, or, and this sacrificial obedience is what he calls us to in our daily walk. But our sacrifice was not like Jesus's. We, our sacrifice isn't for sin. Jesus's was that whenever, whenever he died on that cross, that was for us. And yeah, I mean, we sacrifice for Christ, for our walk with Christ. But our sacrifice is laying down our own will, our preferences, our comfort, and at times even our lives. 
in order to walk in his spirit and fulfill his mission. Faith plus obedience equals sacrifice honored by God. That simple equation is the best way to sum up Abraham and Isaac. Faith means that we need to go past our own resources in order to trust God. Hebrews 11 verse 1 in, in the Amplified Version says, Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see, and the conviction of their reality, faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. Enduring faith involves trusting God in every circumstance. When my transmission went out, I had to trust God. How am I going to pay my power bill? How am I going to buy groceries? Every single time he came through. And this trust enables us to remain true to God and to his word at all times. Faith takes God at his word and relies completely on his promises. It causes us to pursue a deeper relationship with Christ, to trust his goodness and to have full confidence in his word. Without trust, there would be no faith. Without faith, there would be no trust. And you cannot have one without the other. Obedience means that we will do what God tells us to do no matter what it might cost us. The best example of that, I believe, would be our missionaries. They give up everything. They give up their comfort. They give up everything they know. And the result is the kind of sacrifice that not only honors God, but that God honors in return. Abraham and his wife, I mean, they were childless when God made this promise that Abraham was going to be the father of many nations. How are you going to be a father of many nations whenever you don't have any kids? 25 years went by before that promise was fulfilled. Abraham was 75 whenever God gave him that promise. And he did not have that child until, well, Sarah didn't have that child until she was 90 and Abraham was 100. Can you imagine having a child that old? <laughs> but God eventually gave them that miracle son then shockingly God asked the unthinkable of Abraham and I mean I don't have kids but I, can't ev I cannot even imagine what I would do if I would even be able to say, I mean, I would like to be able to stand up here and say beyond a shadow of a doubt, yes, God, I will sacrifice. But I can't. Abraham didn't, he didn't hesitate. I mean, I'm sure he was scared. I'm sure he had questions. But he didn't, he didn't hesitate. And in Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2, sometime later God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you.
Again, just like in the first calling that God called Abraham to leave your home. God didn't first start out telling him where he was going. And in verse 2, sacrifice him on a mountain, I will show you. He didn't know which one he was going to. He knew the region he was going to. We'll find later that God does not like child sacrifice. He finds it detestable. It never entered his mind as a serious thing. Whenever God commanded Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, it was as a test. Abraham may have known this. I don't know. I, he, he may have felt in his spirit that this was a test. But regardless of what he knew or didn't know, Abraham trusted God's plan. Abraham's faith was tested with three extreme tests. First, God told him to leave his people, his country, without knowing where he was going. Then God required Abraham to trust the covenant promise, even though he did not see it fulfilled for 25 years. And now God commanded that Abraham offer Isaac, the promised son, on an altar of sacrifice to the Lord. I don't think any of the tests that we find ourselves going through today can even come close to this last one. In Genesis 22, verses 3 through 9, early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up. No hesitation. God told Abraham to leave his homeland. No hesitation. And in spite of the pain and questioning that I imagine he was wrestling with, no hesitation. He trusted God's plan. Now, I would think this would be very confusing to Abraham. God commanded Abraham do something that was completely contrary to common sense and to his fatherly love. And it went against what Abraham knew about God, including the promise that God had made about Isaac. In verse 4, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Abraham had to walk three days after God told him, go sacrifice your son. Three days, I would have turned around and went back within the first five minutes. I probably wouldn't even left my house. Three days knowing I got to go sacrifice my son. That's faith. That's trust. In verse 5, he said to his servant, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then look at this next part. Then we will come back to you. That shows that Abraham believed and trusted that God had a plan that whether it was going to be God's going to raise Isaac from the dead or God's going to provide another lamb or something. Abraham, I mean, yeah, Abraham knew that God had a plan and he trusted that plan. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself called the, carried the fire and knife as the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. 
And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. I love verse 5. We will come back. He, he had trust in me. He believed God's plan from the beginning. I think that was the only way he was able to leave his home for these three days, knowing i got to go sacrifice my son for three days. I don't know when we're going to get there. I don't know how long it's going to take us to get there. Know the region, don't know the mountain, don't know where on the mountain God wants me to build this altar. Like I said, I mean, I wouldn't have even left. I don't think I could have. I wish I had faith like Abraham. It was his faith in God's promises that he was able to obey the command to sacrifice Isaac as a burnt offering. I mean, God ultimately sent his only son for a sacrifice for us, to be the perfect sacrifice for all of mankind, sin, to bridge that gap between God and humanity. Faith and obedience cannot be separated. You cannot have one without the other. If the Holy Spirit is to work through us with power, faith-inspired obedience and obedience-centered faith will need to mark our lives. These tests on our spiritual lives, they're, they're not easy. They're never easy. If they were easy, that wouldn't be much of a test. Jesus, who was later tempted in the wilderness for 40 days before he started his public ministry. Abraham was also being tested. Testing usually precedes blessing because God desires to see what is really in our hearts. And, you know, I mean, I... You know, and, and I think a lot of times, or for the most part, that's going to be the only way we're going to be able to, is stop looking at the here and now and look at the what's to come. In Genesis 22, 10 through 18, we're going to see where God provides for, for Abraham and for Isaac. In verse 10, he says, Then 
Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that, you're fear, that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Verse 13, we see God provided for his son. God provided for Abraham, and he provided for Isaac. Abraham obeyed the Lord and found God's miraculous provision in two different ways. First, a ram to sacrifice instead of his son. And the second, the reassurance that God would fulfill his word to bless the nations through Abraham. And Abraham called the place of his testing the Lord will provide. Ultimately, the same Father God would provide his own son, Jesus, as a sacrifice for us. Abraham's situation shows two ways that God deals with his followers still today. He will test to see if anything or anyone has captured our love more than our love for God. Was Abraham's love for his son greater than his love for God? In the second way, he will test whether our hope is in him or in the temporary blessings that come from the covenant. Had Abraham's hope in God and trust in God's promise shifted to something else? God, I mean, Abraham received a son that God promised. Did that trust, that hope change? I think he trusted God even more. I mean, how could you not? You're 100 years old, your wife is 90 years old, and you have a son. How can you not trust God more than, more than you did before? The Lord, I mean, he tests us to grow. It's not, it's not to harm, as the video says. It's not to do any harm. It's not to discourage us. It's not to point out where we're wrong. It's to help us grow. It's to reveal what is really in our hearts and to refine us. It helps to remo remove impurities and the compromises that keeps us spiritually weak. We could go every day, every year, from here on out, without any test. But I don't think, I don't think we would grow. I mean, we read God's word, but even in God's word, we're tested. We have to know God's word. He, he tells us in his word what we have to do. And if we don't do it, we're not going to grow. If we don't know his word, we're not going to grow. But these tests, they, they help refine us. Just like whenever we go through a fire, whenever you put, if you're building a sword, you put it in a fire to harden it, to help it just firm up. 
that's what these tests do for us. I mean, they show you where you need to work or what you need to work on. They show you what you need to get out of your life. And just like with Abraham, these tests usually involve two things. Obedience to something the Lord is asking us to do and trust for his provision beyond our resources. This is the pathway to a life of faith. Hebrews 11, verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. These have come so that the, provi- that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed the writer of Hebrews tells us that pleasing God without faith is impossible God wants us to have faith in him he wants us to put our trust in him so much to where we won't find it anywhere else. It is the testing of our faith that brings the fruitfulness in our lives that will bring glory to God. Faith plus obedience equals sacrifice honored by God. This past few weeks, well, a couple of weeks ago, actually, there was this spiritual battle going on in my life, and it was one thing after another after another. And I don't think it was more of anything like physically attacking me or anything it was a distraction and I I think looking back I mean I can look at that as a test I allowed that distraction from that battle to take my eyes off of God it revealed to me where I had slacked off of reading my Bible in the morning and moved it to at night and for me, I should have known better because, I mean, I've never been able to do it that way. If I don't start my day out with God in the morning, then the rest of the day just goes bad. But these tests, we, we need these tests from God. We need them, like I said, to show us where we're spiritually weak at. It is not only to do that, but it is to help us, help our faith grow in God. So this week, this this handout has got some, several questions on here. Go through these questions and think about them. Write, write your answers down in a journal. Pray about it. Ask God where, where you need to be tested at. But don't ask it if you're not willing, if you're not willing to be tested. Miss Phyllis? Father God, I thank you. God, I thank you for 
for your word. I thank you for these tests that you reveal to us in your word, that you show us what happens whenever there is obedience. Because, God, whenever we look at these stories, whenever we look at your promises, whenever we read your word, our faith grows in you. And, God, I pray that if anybody is being tested right now, God, that, that they understand that they can put that faith in you. And, Lord, I just ask that you just go with us this week, God. Help us as we lean on you. Help us to lean on you and to trust you and your promises, to trust your word, God. And, Lord, if there's anybody that just needs a touch from you, God. I just pray that you do what only you can do in the way that only you can do it, in the time that only you will do it. Lord, we love you, and I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for your love for us, God. In your name I pray, amen.